it's time for us to check back in with Louisa in the book Mountain Path. If you've missed the previous chapters, I have a playlist called Mountain Paths. So you can go back and check those out. If you remember, at the last, where we left off in the last chapter, Louisa had just realized the man that was taking her to Cane Break, or Cave Creek, whichever it is, the Cane Break School, was Chris Bledsoe. That was the man that she had been hearing a lot about, and she was afraid of him, and then she realized that was actually who she was with. So we're going to start back up there where we left off. Two log houses, one large and old, the other small and new. A tall, barefooted boy and a red cow with a too prominent backbone were the only signs of civilization encountered on the way. The mule's shadows stretched ever farther before them, and Louisa, giving up all hope of dinner, consoled her outraged stomach with thoughts of supper when it reminded her with a thrust of gnawing that she had not eaten since morning. It now seemed that countless ridges with their pines and twisting roads of red and yellow sand lay behind her, shutting the world as she had known it away. The man Chris rode with her as other men might ride alone. Deep in his own thoughts and forgetful of her company, yet polite enough if she chanced a question, it irked her not a little that he should be so unconcerned by her presence. While she rode conscious of his every movement, her mind taken up with as to what manner of man he might be. She wondered if he had killed a man, as the trustee said, and wondered at herself still more because she thought it might be true and had no fear of him, only a great pity and a hope that it might not be so. They came to a ridge longer and higher than any of the others. The pines were larger here, with less undergrowth between, affording glimpses into blue stretches of outlying ridges and hills. A few, but only a few, showed tiny bald patches that might be hill pastures or fields of corn, but nowhere was there smoke or sight or sound of people. The ridge curved upon itself, forming a narrow horseshoe, then stopped abruptly as if afraid to go farther. She could see no road beyond the ridge end, only the tops of pine trees glistening in the sunlight. This is the jumping off place, the man said, hastening his mule a little, as if anxious to be off the ridge. Louisa felt the same urge for haste down into the deep valley. She did not know what might be there below the pines, but whatever it was, safety for the man must be part of it. Without knowing why or caring, she wanted that. The road was steeper than she had dared think it could be. The saddle, together with herself and the bucket of school supplies, seemed always ready to land on the mule's ears, but by some miracle continued to halt itself just back of the dizzying, pitching shoulders. Ma skidded a bit and sat for a time on her hindquarters, but soon righted herself and went on carefully enough. The incline became less severe, but still it was down, always down. Pines became less frequent with a goodly showing of beech and maple and poplar and a scattering of hickory. Sandstone no longer grated under the mule shoes, but limestone stone rocks interspersed with pebbles and blue mud. Then red clay and they were down at last. No sun here but long blue shadows intermingling with the perpetual twilight of green leaves and high hills. The words of her friend of the morning came to her, a sort a lost-like place. He should have said forgotten too, she thought, and an indefinable something lay hold of her so that she felt old and hopelessly sick with nostalgia for her own life back there in Lexington. Ma whinnied and broke into a trot at sight of a zigzag rail fence separating the road from a field of corn. It was then that Louisa saw the place that was to be her home for seven months. Her first thought was a little wonder that any place could look so old and lost and forgotten and yet be the home of people. The Lee Buck Cow Farm lay in a deep, twisting valley among steep hills. The valley was so narrow that no sooner did it get down one hill, but it must start up another immediately. The farm spread itself upward into the hills on all sides, 
The log house and barn surrounded by a weed-grown pasture were on one slope, while fields and an apple orchard rose steeply up the first slopes of the other hill. A rocky road, yellow with dust, separated the house from the barn. Chris led the way to a crooked gate opening into a yard shaded by twisted, gray-trunked apple trees. He helped her dismount, carried her baggage and school supplies to the porch, and came back with no word said. She supposed that she was expected to go into the house. Three fat yellow pigs came and made a soft, inquisitive grunting over her shoes, and from the shade of a log smokehouse, a huddle of hound dogs flapped their ears in lazy greeting. These appeared to be the only living things at home. She felt lost, unwanted, and in the way. Is there anyone at home, she asked as Chris was walking away with the mules. It don't look like it, he answered with a long glance toward the house. Go in and make yourself at home. Somebody will be there directly, he added, and with no further apology went away with the mules and two of the dogs at his heels. She wished that he might have stayed with her, but perhaps in this land, she decided, the care of one's mules came before the duties of hospitality to a new school teacher. She hesitated a time, then walked across the porch through an open door into a large, dimly lighted room with a low ceiling, dark with smoke and age. Directly across from her was another door leading to another porch. In the front of the room, between the doors, was the most enormous fireplace she had ever seen. Whole tree trunks could have flamed in its spacious mall with yet a little room for twigs. The fireplace was flanked on one side by a door opening on a darkened room and on the other by three steps leading to a small closed door, evidently an opening to the loft room. The hearth stones were large slabs of smoothly polished limestone, cracked and broken by long and careless usage. On the mantel was a Bible, little worn, and a Sears Roebuck catalog badly dog-eared. The floor, walls, and ceiling were all bare, all of wide, unpainted pine boards. Back of her, in the dimness, she could see two beds, and by the fireplace stood a red cedar churn with copper bands and two chairs, both crudely made by hand, one covered with a sheepskin, the other bare. She wandered irresolutely through the other outside door and came to the back porch. At one end was a small room through whose open door she glimpsed three or four chairs bottomed with strips of hickory bark and a long table covered with blue oilcloth. The smell of cooking apples reached her nostrils, accompanied by a peculiar grating sound and the soft put put of some thick substance boiling. Greatly cheered by the thought that someone might be home after all, she followed the smell of food and after passing through the room with the table came to the threshold of a small, clean, bare kitchen. She stood a moment and looked with some surprise at what she saw there. In front of a boarded up fireplace was an excessively small stove on which bubbled and hissed an equally small pan of molasses colored apple butter. On the other side of the room, possibly 10 feet away, was an uncommonly large woman energetically stirring the apple butter. She accomplished this by means of a long, narrow strip of lumber to which was nailed on the stirring end a short cross piece of thin wood. Howdy, the woman said, neither showing surprise nor leaving off her stirring. How do you do, Louisa answered in what she hoped was the proper manner for a new school teacher. She took a step further into the kitchen. I suppose you're Mrs. Cow? Ms. Lee Buck Corey Cow, and you're the new teacher. How are you called? Louisa Sheridan, she answered, trying not to stare at the woman. She was large, not hippie after the fashion of well-fed women in cities, but tall and thin and rangy, with long, loosely put-together bones and a long neck set under a long but well-shaped head. Her jaws were long and thin, so was her nose, and her chin long and pointed, almost pretty. Her feet, however, were what caused Louisa to forget that it was impolite to stare. They were long like the rest of her, 
narrow heels, long wide spreading toes with each great toe standing a little apart from its smaller sisters and seemingly enjoying a much wider range of experience. In color, they were a shade darker than her face, but little, uh, but little lighter than her hair, for Corey was a rap rhapsody in brown. Even her blue eyes were flecked with lights the color of brown sand in yellow sunlight. With not a little effort, Louisa withdrew her eyes from the fascination of the great toes on the floor to find that while she had looked at Corey, Corey had examined her too. The apple butter stir had grown gradually slower, at last stopped altogether, while its creator smiled at Louisa. The girl returned the smile and felt an unexpected friendliness for this long woman with her shrewd eyes and young old face. Ye ain't very big, she said, but then the school ain't neither. I heard ye in the big house, she went on in her loud but musical voice, but I can't leave this here apple butter. Lass's apple butter is so spitting, I took this piece of quilting frame and nailed me a stick on it for to stir with. It's quite a nice invention. It is, exceptin' I can't move till the apple butter's done. If and I take it out, I'll get apple butter on the floor, and if and I let loose at this end, she'll fall and turn over the whole works. It's so long I can't bring it past the cupboard. Would, would you like for me to stir a while, Louisa ventured? Was there something you wanted to see about? The woman hesitated. Well, for a fact, I would. The pigs is in the taters. I allowed Chris to get them out, but he's gone to the barn. So if and you don't mind, Louisa came over and took charge of the stir. And with skirt tails swishing about her bare ankles, Corey loped out the door to rescue the potatoes. After a bedlam of sound in which squealing of pigs, pigs and barking of dogs were minor things to the woman's shrill, Yee, sick em, she returned with her apron full of small golden apples. She smiled her slow, shy smile. I thought she might like an apple, their early harvest and powerful good, she said, dumping the apples onto the table. Louisa returned the stir to Corey and fell upon the apples with some relish. Figure to board here, the woman asked cautiously after a time of stirring in silence. If you'll have me, she answered, surprised at herself because of a sudden desire to live with this woman and her family and see how lives so different from her own were lived. Sure, we'll have you. We most generally bored the teachers. Only trouble is, we was figuring on a man and was figuring out to let him sleep in the back house with Chris. Now, I reckon you'll have to take the loft room if and you don't mind. You'll be by yourself for none of the young'uns will sleep up there. The loft room will be fine, she said, thinking that after a day of teaching, solitude, even in a loft, might be a welcome thing. There was a long silence broken only by the sound of the stirring. It'll cost you twelve a month, that if and you think it's worth it, Mrs. Cow said at last in some embarrassment. It was Louisa's turn to be embarrassed. That suits me fine, she said, but I must tell you that I can't pay until... Don't trouble your head none about having no money for payday. Teachers never does. It's still money when it does come. The business of board and room settled, Corey put herself wholeheartedly into the task of getting acquainted with her new boarder. Louisa answered all her questions in good spirit with no feeling of rancor, rather one of admiration for their directness and simplicity. No need to be getting homesick then, Corey said when she learned that Lexington was Louisa's hometown. I, I don't think I'll get homesick, but she confessed thinking of the long twisting roads across ridges. Lexington does seem a long way from here. It is a good piece, but somehow it never seems so far. You've been there? Me? Go to Lexington? No. Chris, he's been there, and Lee Buck, too. But all the time Lee Buck was there, he never seemed so far away. With Frankfurt now, she added with a kind of pensive seriousness, it was always different. No place on earth to me could ever seem such a fur piece as Frankfurt. But it's only a little the other side of Lexington, Louisa said, with a sudden desire to begin her career as a schoolteacher by instructing this woman in geography. 
I know, Corey answered, like one who didn't know. They say that after you get in Lexington, it just takes a little while to go on to Frankfurt, but all the same, they say Lexington is a pretty town. I think Frankfurt is pretty too, with the hills around it and the river and all the old houses. It's in a hole so deep, like Corey said. They say that down there on the river, it's awful hot in the summers and cold in the winters. Louisa smiled at the woman's strong distaste for a town she had never seen. I suppose your husband didn't like it either. Did he work there? No, Lee Buck never worked there. He was only there just a short time, a long while back. Uh, I'm plumb forgetting this apple butter, she added, and turned and began to stir with quick, noisy movements. I suppose your husband sells his tobacco up around Lexington and Frankfurt, Louisa said after a moment spent in trying to think of something else to say. Corey continued to stir with such force that it seemed the pan would be jerked from the stove. We never raised tobacco, she answered after a time. Our land growed it, I reckon, but it's like Lee Buck says. What's the sense of growing something you ain't done with when you put it in the barn, and when it's all stripped and fixed, you have to haul it off and sell it for maybe nothing? Louisa saw an opening for further conversation. I suppose you raise corn mostly? Yes'm. Corn and lasses cane. They ain't so much trouble. It must be hard, though, to take the corn to market over these roads. Oh, Lee Buck, he never has to do that. He uses all his corn at, uh, at uh, this apple butter seems been on burning. I wonder now if you'd mind to go to the stove and shed off the damper so the fires will die down. I can't let loose of this stir. Louisa did as the woman requested, took another apple from the table, bit into it, thinking all the while of corn and how hard it must be for a man to support a family by farming the narrow twisting valleys and steep hill fields. I suppose, she said, you can feed the corn to hogs. Yes, um, Corey said with a sudden bright quickness. That's just what we do, feed all the corn to hogs. Louisa bit slowly into the apple, took it carefully away from her lips, chewed without tasting, and looked hard at the long brown woman who stood and stirred apple butter as if the whole of her present and future being depended on keeping it from burning. She looked at nothing but the pan, bouncing and jiggling on the stove, and had every appearance of being a person too busy with important matters to be bothered with trivial conversation. Louisa looked at the pan, too. It was not smoking, hardly boiling. I don't think, she began, and was silent in the face of a growing awareness of so uh, something in the room that had not been there when she entered it. She looked at Corey. She saw the forced quickness of her movements, the rigidity of her head, a tenseness in her face that had not been there a moment before. It is as if something tortured her, she thought. She mechanically bit into the apple again and understood that the torturer was herself. She tried to remember the conversation. She had only talked of the things that came first into her head. What had she said last? What had Corey said? Such a fur piece as Frankfurt. No, that was before. It must be the corn. They fed all their corn to hogs. Lexington was not so far away, but Frankfurt, hmm. She took her teeth away from the apple without biting out a piece and noiselessly flipped it through the open window. She was no longer hungry. The federal district court was at Lexington, the penitentiary at Frankfurt, and they fed all their corn to hogs. She had swallowed the last bite of apple, but it seemed stuck in her throat, choking her. If she didn't quit looking at the woman, she would turn around in a moment and the torture show in her eyes. She stared out the window. Her half-eaten apple lay there. A fat black and white hen came and pecked at it. I suppose you keep a lot of chickens. That would surely be all right. It must have been, for when she was able to look and listen again, the woman was just a woman, lazily stirring apple butter and saying something about white leghorns being bad cookers and good layers. But Plymouth rocks were just the other way. I reckon this old apple butter is finally done, Corey said not long after. 
When she had taken out the stir, she walked to the front porch and looked at the length of the hill shadow on the western slopes of the valley. I reckon we'll have time to take your things up to the loft room and get you settled for milking time, she told Louisa after a survey of the shadow. I'll start carrying up now, Louisa said, taking two of her smaller bags from the pile in which Chris had placed them. I'll take a load up first. Ye wait here. I got a pile, a pile of fodder beans I gotta get out of the way. She picked up a bag and turned hastily toward the big house door. Louisa, in her eagerness to see the loft room, followed Corey to the door, protesting as she walked. Oh, don't bother with the beans. I'm sure they won't be in my way. I'll just go on up with you and get settled that much sooner. Corey lifted the bag over the door sill and said nothing. She walked with what seemed to Louisa an unnatural slowness across the room to the stair door, climbed the three steps leading to it, and stopped. I do declare, she said, pushing back the wooden button that held the door in place. I plumb forgot to bring a prop for the winder. It'll be so hot in that place we'll smother. I wonder if you'd mind to go on to the front porch and get that little stick on the big house winder sill while I tote this on up. Louisa put down her load and hurried off for the prop. Not finding it in the place designated, she spent a little time in looking on and under the porch, but in the end was forced to return without such a piece of wood. The door was open, so she carried her bags up the dark, steeply twisting stair. Breathless from her struggle with the bags, she stood a moment on the top step, looking about the large, bleak room and watching Corey, who seemed unaware of her presence. She was squatting on her heels with her back to Louisa and hastily picking small, pale, greenish bits of something from the floor and dropping them into what appeared to be a bag formed of a sheet gathered loosely into her other hand. I hope you didn't spill the fodder beans, Louisa called to her, feeling somehow gay at sight of the room. She liked it, even if it did contain nothing more than a wooden bed with no mattress and a small fireplace. I guess I've got them all, Corey answered, rising from her squatting position without ceasing to search the floor with her eyes. She saw one of the small somethings and bent and picked it up. That surely is the last one, she said with more satisfaction than Louisa would have expected from such a trivial accomplishment. You can leave them up here, she said as Corey started down the stairs with her load. It looks as if you would have enough beans to do for some time, she added, noting the size of the bundle. Ye like fodder beans? I never ate any. But you know what they look like. No, I was just thinking I would like to see some. Corey continued down the stairs. Sometime I'll show you some, she said. When she heard the woman's bare feet on the big house floor below, Louisa went over and looked in the corner of the room that she had searched, but could find nothing. She didn't know how it was that she knew. It was either due to the broken windows that didn't need props, or because of her reason that told her green beans would be dark instead of pale when dried. In any case, she knew the load on Corey's back had not been dried green beans. She wondered what it was, most likely some poor, peculiar food that the woman was ashamed of. She saw in one cobwebby corner among a tangle of other forgotten things a long, extraordinarily heavy muzzle-loading rifle. She liked anything old or curious and forgot the mystery of the beans in examining the gun and an old rusty pistol found near it. She had carried the gun to the window and was scrutinizing its many-sided barrel and the grain of the wood in the stock when Corey returned with a broom and a hammer for driving the large nails that were served as clothes hooks. I'm making myself at home and looking at this old gun, Louisa said, trying to put a gay thoughtlessness into her voice and make the woman know she had forgotten about the fodder beans. She bent to look at the gun again, intent on a search for a possible trademark. She continued to search, waiting meanwhile for Corey to make some answer to her light remark. When she had remained too long silent, Louisa turned and looked at her. She stood motionless above the stair hole, her eyes fixed on the old gun, her face expressive of something stronger and deeper than curiosity over a forgotten relic. Still, she appeared to be thinking of the gun. This must be very old, Louisa said to break the silence. I'd clean forgot that old thing, Corey answered. I'll take it off to the smokehouse and get it out of the way. 
I wouldn't mind having it around. I like guns. Corey's glance swept her face. You like guns? Her look made Louisa feel guilty. Why, she didn't know. Her thoughts grew confused so that she could not explain what she meant when she said that she liked guns. She liked the old one in her hand because she admired anything that was strong and old and well made, different from the new things all of a pattern. In physics, she had studied projectile tracery and learned to appreciate a stark beauty in the mathematical laws governing the precision of guns, just as she loved pure science and reason in all things. But now, under this woman's troubled glance, guns changed into things that were neither museum pieces nor symbols of the mechanization of science. I mean, she stammered that I, I, I like guns in one way, I guess. I don't like to shoot or anything like that. Corey's face did not relax. I can't th think that any woman could like a gun. Me, I hate the things, if and they are all over the place. Louisa laid the gun on the floor and wiped dust and rust from her fingers. I I'd better start unpacking, she said, and went downstairs for her last bag. Corey swept and drove nails into the wall and brought up coverings for the bed. The tick for it is empty, but soon as the young'uns get in, I'll send them to the corn crib for shucks, she told Louisa. That will be fine, she answered, and you might as well take this down your next trip, and she looked toward the old gun. She now wanted to be rid of it. It was almost as if she had the same loathing for it that Corey had. Corey had a reason, probably something that led to Frankfurt. She thought of the town, her here for two, Pleasant imagery of it blurred and wavered until it too, like the gun, grew alien and distorted, seen as it was through the eyes of this tall hill woman. So Louisa has finally reached her destination. She's not seen the school yet, but she's finally got to the Lee Buck Cow place. There's so many things in this chapter that jumped out at me. One of them is when her and Chris are beginning they're along those high ridges and then they start down uh, into the valley so that they're going to go to Lee Buck Cow's house so that where Louisa will be staying. I love the descriptive nature of that. If you've ever ridden horses before, Matt and I used to have horses. Of course, these they were on mules. Chris and Louisa was on a mule, but same thing. If you've ever ri ridden one and you're going down a steep incline, you do feel like the saddle might be scooting forward. Hopefully, you've got it on right and it's not doing that, but you kind of feel that thrust. You can feel it. Uh, the part they were going down was so steep that Louisa's mule, Maul, actually sat down, sat down on her rump. So that was a very steep one. So I can just, I can just feel and hear the creak of the saddle and feel that movement on that part. And th the description of those landscapes, those high ridges, oh my goodness, they're so beautiful. When you're on a high ridge in Appalachian, you can see for miles and miles and miles. You can see the far blue mountains as those ridges, as they line up. There's just nothing, I mean, it's just so beautiful. But so is when you go down into the valleys, down into the dark hollers, as I like to say, there's a beauty in that too. And I think that descriptiveness in the book really speaks to uh, and that old, the part when she got to the house and she said she didn't know anything could be that old. It looked so old. All that speaks really to the sense of place. So many Appalachians feel this sense of place. Living in this amazing landscape from those towering ridges to those deep dark hollers, it somehow becomes part of who you are. And that's why so many people like me don't want to leave. There, there's other reasons, but the sense of place definitely plays a role in it. And sense of place is the very landscape, those high ridges and dark hollers and the, the waterways, all those kind of things. It's also the sense of place when you think of uh, familial or relatives and friends, like you know who, who's who, all that. That plays a role in that too. But I really love that part of the book, that descriptive nature. I, I really enjoyed the part when she gets to the house and that she meets Corey for the first time. One of the stereotypes about Appalachians in the past and even today is that they're really, you know, not very intelligent. Well, how intelligent for Corey to m take her quilting frame and make her a long stir to be able to sit there and stir that apple butter. Isn't that inventive? Isn't that just great? If you've ever made apple butter or applesauce either, it, it does bubble and spit at you constantly. It's something you've really got to watch or it'll scorch, especially apple butter if you're making it like that in a pot on the stove or over a fire like in days gone by like they used to do. So I really enjoyed that part too. 
truthfully, I could go page by page and say, I really like this part, and I like this part, and I like that she used these words, and I like that she used those words. It's just, I, I just really, this is one of my favorite books about Appalachia. You can probably already tell that. So there's just so many things I could talk about. One of the things, when she does mention fodder beans, so those fodder beans, those were dried green beans. And in some parts of Appalachia, they call them fodder beans. Sometimes they're called shucky beans or shuck beans. And then where I live, they're called leather britches. So all the same thing just means dried beans but go but by a lot of different names so i found that really interesting um but i hope that you'll leave a comment and tell me what you found interesting what jumped out at you and then you know she's louise has arrived to where she's going but now there's so many mysteries still mysteries of you know well they feed all their corn to the hogs you can kind of see where that's going and why did frankfurt uh, and lexington why did that those things you know bothered Corey when she talked on Lexington didn't but Frankfurt did when when they were talking about it why did why was that um, and and another thing that I really enjoyed is Louisa even in this chapter this has just been a common current all through what we've read so far is that she thinks these people are strange she's slightly afraid like even and disappointed when she's eating the apple she throws the apple outside because she just can't finish it because in her mind she's putting together they feed all their corn to the hogs and she doesn't like frankfurt because that's where lee buck was at and and that's where the prison or the penitentiary is but yet there's like she admires them already she barely knows them and she's got lots of questions but there's this current of admiration that somehow she admires them already and senses this about them this um I don't know their presence that she just really really likes so far the one she's met now she's not met lee buck or the kids yet that's coming next i'm sure but I, I i really see that coming through this this part of the book too just like it did in everything we've read so far where she thinks these people are strange yet i'm drawn to them yet i admire them so i find that really interesting too but please leave me a comment let me know what you liked about the book and please continue to drop back by. Now we've got to find out what happens when Lee Buck Cal and the kids come home.